Hello. It's been brought to my attention that we should deal with environmental impact assessments in the usual manner by my review of the material in Bates, which is chapter 10. And tonight's seminar is in relation to that presentation. So if you'd like to follow me, um, starting at page 341, which is chapter 10, it runs through to page 424, so it is a very substantial chapter. You'll see initially that it's broken into four, uh, perhaps five sections. The first is the introduction for about nine pages. The second deals with the federal environmental impact assessment regime. Uh, that is for matters of national environmental significance under EPBCA. And that runs from pages 350 to 373 inclusive. We then move on to the third part, which is state-based environmental impact assessments, pages 373. Uh, through to 416, but of significance is the Queensland section, page 392 to page 400. Now, parts D and E deal with common criticisms of the regime and the conclusion, which is pa pages 416 through to 424. Okay, let's break that down. Firstly, part A, dealing with the introduction, and this runs for about nine pages. At 10.1 on page 341, Bates says, environmental impact assessment, EIA, is a systematic process for examination and evaluation of the environmental effects of proposed activities that are considered likely to be significant in terms of an effect on the environment. Ideally, impact assessments should also include an, an assessment of possible alternatives to the proposal, monitoring of predicted and actual Im impacts, and auditing to determine compliance. At very least, it should provide decision makers with enough information to formulate conditions of development consent. And you'll recall that Phil Jeston made comment that for a major project, the likely cost of a comprehensive environmental impact assessment uh, could be in the order of $500,000 through to about $4 million um, in today's pricing structures. As indicated in Chapter 8, says Bates, environmental assessment is a feature of all levels of strategic environmental planning and management. Ideally, in pursuit of ecological sustainable development, such strategic environmental assessment should also govern the preparation of all government plans, programs and policies. All right, through to page, sorry, through to 10.4. Although environmental impact assessment can be required Merely as a matter of government policy, the tendency has to been to give statutory recognition to the process. And at 10.5, EIAs generally incorporate most, if not all, of the following procedural steps. And you'll see that the procedural steps are, are laid out there in dot point form, and I'll get you to read that for yourself. There is the question um, in the next heading of determination of the need for an environmental impact assessment. And at the start of page 345, in Queensland, where an environmental impact assessment may be automatically triggered if a proposed activity is of a certain class or fill, falls within a certain, certain class of proposal, a decision on the need for an impact assessment may be assisted by statutory powers to request or require information to be supplied. Now I'll take you through to 10.14, which deals with the role of the environmental impact assessment in decision making. EIA does not introduce an environmental veto power into administrative decision making power. When the Commonwealth's Environment Protection Impact of Proposals Act was passed in 74, now the EPBCA, the then Minister of Environment said of the legislation, it will not grant me the exclusive power of veto of proposals. It will present the government with comprehensive information about environmental impact as an aid to decision making. And again, it's extraordinary how new all this is in the context of law, as we've um, pointed out a number of times already in this course. Look, I'll, I'll go through now to part B, which um, deals with federal environmental assessment for matters of national environmental significance under EPBCA pages 350 to 374. At 10.17, the EPBCA retains the concept of significant environmental impact 
a concept that has received some judicial scrutiny. Uh, that's covered later in this chapter, but places the responsibility for determining this now with the Environment Minister. The EPBCA categorically defines the environmental issues in which the Commonwealth is interested in conducting assessments before issuing Commonwealth approvals. Now, there are seven headings which are relevant to the major heading of federal environmental assessments. The first heading is um, federal state cooperative arrangements. And you'll recall that Phil Jeston spoke about this at some length. At 10.18, any particular project that is con a controlled action under EPBCA will have the potential to attract both state and federal environment assessment requirements if approvals must be obtained from both levels of government. In the event of a conflict, the federal controls will clearly prevail. Government policy is clearly to approach the environmental assessment in a cooperative and in a manner that does not require duplication. Um, that's covered in 10.26. Uh, Section 10 of the EPBCA specifically declares that the Act is not intended to exclude or limit the concurrent operation of any law of a state or territory except so far as a contrary intention applies. Okay, so that's the federal state cooperative arrangements. The second major heading in this um, part dealing with federal environmental impact assessment is strategic assessment. At 10.20, if the impact of the government plans and policies is assessed at the outset, then the, the cumulative impacts of actions carried out under the plans can also be identified and assessed. Assessment of a particular activity conducted under such plan need not be as rigorous as might otherwise be the case, or even indeed undertaken at all. Now, particular activities should only be exempted from assessment if a strategic assessment has clearly all, already factored in those proposals. At 10.21, EPBCA allows the Minister to agree with persons responsible for adoption or implementation of plans, policies or programs that strategic assessment should be made of the relevant impacts of actions that are controlled actions. Uh, controlled actions we'll deal with later in 10.28, uh, um, which or would otherwise um, not be exempted. <coughs> Now, an agreement to make a provision um, for uh, needs to uh, cater for a number of factors, and they're uh, identified in uh, 10.22. Right, so the third heading dealing with federal is controlled actions on page 354. And at 10.26, Bates says, Commonwealth environmental assessment applies to controlled actions. Now, the term action was discussed in Chapter 5, um, uh, 5.70, and there's a range of things that are described as an action, and they are um, under Section 523 of EPBCA, a project, a development, an undertaking, an activity, or any alteration of those. All right, so we know what um, an action is, and the Commonwealth um, regime applies to a controlled action. That is, those actions for which approval is required under Part 3 of the Act, those are either matters of national environmental significance or involve Commonwealth land. Bates then goes on to talk about controlled actions, A, and then um, that is matters of national environmental significance, and they mainly refer to significant impact issues, if you look at that list, and then B, Commonwealth activities. There are some things which are controlled actions exempt from the provisions at 10.27. The environmental assessment provisions do not apply to controlled actions that a bilateral agreement declares not necessary. Now, bilateral agreements are defined in section 45, subsection 2 of the Act, and they're agreements essentially between the Commonwealths and the states. At just over the page, the reason for such exemption <clears throat> is that some form of strategic assessment will usually be required before such an arrangement can be made. Now Bates goes on to talk briefly about referrals at 10.29, where persons that are proposing to take action that they think may be a controlled action 
must refer the proposal to the Minister for Determination. Now, you remember the comments made by Phil Jeston in that regard, where consultants tend to be conservative, and if there is a concern that a matter may be a, a controlled action, then they will uh, err on the side of caution and make the referral. Bates refers to blue wedges against the Minister for Environment, where it's quoted um, as saying, the court is quoted as saying, the Act was drafted on the assumption that it would be preferable that proposed actions be referred at an early stage in their development. And uh, as Phil Jeston said, that's, that's usually what happens. At 10.32, it would defeat the purposes of the environmental impact assessment if the cumulative impacts of a project could be distorted by referrals in stages. EPBCA now provides that if a minister receives a referral in relation to a proposal to take an action, and the minister is satisfied the action is the subject of a referral, uh, the, ma the, the subject of the referral is a component of a larger action that the person proposes to take, then the minister may decide not to accept the referral and ask for the whole uh, referral to be considered in bulk. Consultation 10.34. After receiving referral, the minister may invite appropriate Commonwealth ministers to provide information. Members of the public must also be invited at that stage. Significant environmental impact, 10.35, a referral will be made because of the likelihood that the proposal will have significant environmental impact. And over the page at 10.36, we see the test of significance. It's essentially two parts. The first is whether there's a likelihood of impact, and the second is a consideration of the extent of the impact. And uh, there's reference there to Booth and Bosworth, a federal court decision. Down the bottom of page 360, the term impact could readily include the indirect consequences of an action and impacts occasioned by persons other than the proponent. Over the page, 10.40, uh, there's reference to a case of Anvil Hill Project Watch Association against the Minister for Environment. And in that uh, case, it was decided that the construction and operation of an open cut coal mine was not a controlled action potential impacts on matters protected by part three were uncertain and conjectural. Perhaps they might regard that as a rather surprising decision, I would think. Now, the fourth heading dealing with federal issues commences at 10.43, and it's under the heading environmental assessment of actions. If an action has been determined to be a controlled action, and it's not otherwise exempt from the environmental assessment process, then the Minister must choose one of the following methods of assessing the relevant impact. And there's the, the um, six different types are identified there. And if you want to look at the section, it's section 87.1 of EPBCA. Now, how does the Minister decide on what is the appropriate method of assessment? The Minister can't decide, says Bates at 10.46, on the appropriate approach until prescribed information has been received. And before making a decision, the Minister must consider a number of factors and they're identified at the tail end of that paragraph. I'll get you to move now to the fifth of seven headings under the Commonwealth regime, approval of actions, and over the page on page 370, if the Minister decides to issue a conditional approval, conditions must be necessary or convenient for protecting a matter. The Minister must also not act inconsistently with Australia's international obligations for world heritage. Audits, 10.56, conditions attached to approvals may require an environmental audit of the action to be carried out contraventions over the page will attract civil penalties. That is a contravention of a condition. <clears throat> it will be an offence, and this is towards the tail end of page 371, to recklessly contravene the conditions of an approval and that contravention results or will result in a significant impact on the matter protected under part three. The key word there, significant. The sixth heading under the federal jurisdiction is assessment of actions that are not controlled actions. And the seventh is assessment by agreement with the state or territory. I won't comment on those.
All right, so, so far in dealing with this chapter, we've dealt with the introduction, we've dealt with the federal regime, it's now turned our minds to the state regime, bearing in mind, of course, that this regime is subject to bilateral agreements between the Commonwealth and the state, as we discussed earlier. So at 10.61, the general comment is made that all states have legislated for environmental impact assessment, though the precise requirements differ markedly from state to state. New South Wales, in a sense, leads the way with the most detailed and most judicially scrutinised scheme. But let's not worry about New South Wales for the moment. Let's go to Queensland at page 392, and that'll run for about eight pages. In Queensland, environmental impact assessment takes place both under the, it takes place both under the planning system, represented by the Sustainable Planning Act, and also the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act of 71, and the system for environmental management introduced by the Environmental Protection Act uh, 1994. So we have the three regimes in terms of environmental impact assessment under the state law in Queensland. The first, EIA under the planning scheme, um, starts at 10.93 and Bates says, the requirement for impact assessment for an environmental impact statement is part of the Integrated Development Assessment System, IDAS, established by the former Integrated Planning Act and continued under the Sustainable Planning Act. And you remember we talked at some length about IDAS previously. EIA only applies to assessable development. The assessment may be made uh, either as a code assessment or an impact assessment. And you recall that impact assessment means the assessment other than a code assessment. And code assessment means an assessment of development by the assessment manager against the common material applicable codes and other relevant criteria set out in section 313. Now at 10.94, the assessment manager and each concurrence agency may seek information from the applicant. A proponent of a development to which EIS process applies must apply to the chief executive for terms of reference for the EIS. And at 10.95, the final decision made by the assessment manager should not conflict with state planning regulatory provisions or other relevant instruments. And you'll recall, of course, that state planning regulatory provisions sit at the top of the hierarchy in terms of um, uh, environmental instruments uh, in Queensland. All right, so that's the first third of the discussion about environmental impact assessment in Queensland, which is EIA under the planning scheme. The second way in which environmental impact assessment is relevant in Queensland is where it applies under the um, uh, State Development and Public Works Organisation Act, which was actually referred to as the third one in Bates, but we'll, we'll deal with it now. 10.96, projects that are declared to be significant by the Coordinator General may be subjected to a more formal process for environmental impact assessment. For example, infrastructure would be um, one instance. And you remember that Phil Jeston made reference to the role of the Coordinator General during his discussion. Now, this is important at the tail end of 10.96. Principles of judicial review are expressed not to apply to decisions of the Coordinator General under these provisions. So it's not one where um, the legality of the decision-making process can be challenged through judicial review. At 10.99, if the project requires development approval and is either for a material change of use or requires impact assessment under the Sustainable Planning Act, the Coordinator General effectively becomes the concurrence agency for the project. Now, the third way that EIA is relevant in the state regime is where it's referred to under the Environmental Protection Act. Applications for approval are required for environmentally relevant activities, and they're defined in Schedule 4 um, as activities prescribed by regulation. Over the page, the purposes of the EIS not only assist regulators making informed decisions on applications, but also to assist in the preparation of an environmental management plan for the project. All right, um, so they're the three issues that are relevant to
environmental impact assessments and a state regime. That then leaves us for the balance of the chapter, uh, part D on page 416 which deals with common criticisms. During the 40 years or so, which government regulatory authorities have dealt with environmental issues, certain issues, says Bates, have come to light. And what he does is outline some of the issues that are commonly arisen. At 10.14, he makes the comment that EIA documentation will be prepared by, or at least on behalf of, persons having the greatest stake in the acceptance of the proposal. Therefore, one might expect that the terms would reflect as favourably as possible the interests of the clients in question. At 10.143, Stuart, a commentator, um, in his commentary, Environmental Risk Assessment, 1993, pointed out the following. The old adage that he who pays the piper calls the tune has some relevance. There's reference then later in that paragraph to accreditation of consultants that undertake EIA is still not a feature of legislation in Australia. So it's not heavily regulated at this stage. At 10.145, talking about the process, environmental assessment often commences after too many decisions have already been made. And you'll remember the comment made earlier that ideally these things are dealt with early on in the process. At 10.147, Bates makes reference to public participation. EIA procedures, and this is a, one of the common criticisms, EIA procedures do not give sufficient weight to the principle and value of public comment, risk, suspicion, and hostilities towards their activities and decisions. At 10.150, many EIA reports are unnecessarily long-winded and repetitive. Over the page, another common criticism, 10.151. A common criticism from proponents of a development is that preparation of an EIS delays implementation of a project. And uh, certainly, Phil Jeston talked in general terms of, you know, at least 18 months. Second paragraph of that, uh, of that um, paragraph says, uh, EIA process for a major development would take at least a year to complete, so 18 months perhaps. 10.152, one of the failures of most EIA systems relates to the, the lack of post-decision monitoring, monitoring to assess whether controls are adequate or predictions are correct and monitoring and auditing is not a common feature of the requirements of legislation for development. All right, so to wrap up for tonight, and thank you for your patience, I know this is very wordy and, and meaty, but uh, in terms of the conclusion, Bates offers a word of warning, uh, which will be found on page 424, and he says, the progress of projects from conception to, through, to fruition and operation will be assisted if local communities and interest groups are adequately consulted at the earliest stages of a project and kept informed as the project progresses and commences operations. So that's my take on the most important aspects of Bates Chapter 10, dealing with environmental impact assessment. Thank you for listening.